Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Wednesday, June 13th, Market Watchers live show with your hosts, Tom Boley and Aaron Swinlin. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. And for our regulars, welcome back. Well, let's take a look at the market today. Currently, we've got the Dow Jones Industrial Average up another 16 points, the S&P 500 up three, continuing its steady advance. The NASDAQ breaking out to another all-time high, up 40 points today to 77.44. Russell 2000 also trying to advance into record high territory, up a half point. Ten-year Treasury yield is flat today as we prepare for the Fed policy decision coming out at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Volatility index on the decline, back down near 12. This is consistent with bull market territory. Healthcare and consumer discretionary uh, leading the market to the upside. You can see the XLV which is the healthcare sector ETF providing another high after breaking out above this 84 level. We continue to move higher health uh, providers, healthcare providers performing extremely well. You can see that it has coincided. This move has coincided with the breakout overall in the healthcare space. Home construction really struggling today. I wrote in my blog about how important in the short term this 840 level was questioning whether or not we back away from it or whether we break through. Well, right now we're uh, certainly backing away. You can see the group is down more than 3% as it prepares for that Fed announcement this afternoon. A few of the stocks in the entertainment area performing extremely well today. 21st Century Fox up 7.5%, Discovery up 4%, and Walt Disney up uh, almost $3 after gapping down earlier today to test its rising 20-day moving average. All right, it is Wednesday, Aaron. We've got the market still moving higher, although the S&P continues to struggle in that yes. 2775 to 2800 area. Yes, I suspect that those, uh, you know, the Discovery and Disney, probably I think that has to do something with that AT&T uh, merger or discussion yesterday that they said was going to be okay. So I suspect that might be it. Yeah, there's a couple of things going on in that space. One was uh, certainly AT&T. Uh, with their announcement um, that I think the judge ruled that their um, yeah it was in their favor yeah well that that AT and T can proceed with the acquisition of Time Warner and there's no conditions whatsoever I think 21st Century Fox is moving up uh, because now Comcast is expected to challenge Disney's bid for some of Fox uh, some of the Fox assets yep. So, Disney went down originally, but now Disney's come roaring back. Uh, Discovery's still up, the ISCA. And then, of course, we've got um, 21st Century Fox benefiting from all that as well. So a lot, of, uh, a lot of stuff going on, but especially that Fed meeting this afternoon, everyone's going to be keeping an eye on. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I we guess. have a – I just want to mention we also have a very special guest uh, with us today, uh, Ben Senor, Rick Ben Senor. How are you doing today, Rick? I'm good, Tom. It is. Uh, thanks for having me, and thanks for pronouncing it correctly. Yeah, I wanted to like put the emphasis on that. I wanted to make sure that I was getting it right. <laughs> you. But it's uh, it's great having you on the show. I know you take a look at the market a little different than uh, the rest of us, um, and so really interested. And I'm sure everyone else is very interested in hearing what you have to say. And we'll bring you back in probably in about 10, 15 minutes. Uh, so hang around with us if you don't mind. Of course, looking forward to. It. Awesome. All right, uh, Aaron. Well, we got a bunch to go over and a lot of things to talk about. So why don't we just jump on into the schedule and the agenda and get this. Sure. Thing. We'll get it rolling. So uh, this coming week, we've got Bill. Actually, yeah, Bill Shelby's going to be in here uh, tomorrow, I think. Yes, personal trading workflow. So that'll be great uh, to have Bill in here, not doing an everything stock charts, but doing uh, about what he does as a trader. Arthur Hill is going to be here and he is going to co-host with me on Friday. Since Tom, you'll be out. You will be missed as always. And then I'm going to be doing a workshop on Tuesday of next week. And I'm going to do it on a couple of the different, the main momentum indicators. So we'll be having a discussion about those, uh, sort of an intro. And our schedule though for today, as we were saying, we have our special guest, Rick Bensignor. And the 10 and 10 to 1, our first stock is going to be Michael's Companies, M-I-K. It was sort of a big one on the uh, ticker cloud this morning. And the Scooter Report will be our final segment. So 
Tom, I know there's probably some technical news and headlines, especially as you were talking about with the Fed announcement coming up. Yeah, it's going to be a big day this afternoon, certainly for traders. Um, everyone look for, looks forward to what the Fed's going to do. I think it's almost a foregone conclusion that the Fed will raise a quarter point this afternoon. So anything other than that, I think, would really shock the market. And the market doesn't like shocks. Right. Uh, I, I think it'll probably be that quarter point rise. Um, we did have an uh, economic report out this morning. We had the uh, producer price index. May PPI came in much hotter than expected. Uh, rising 0.5%. Market was only expecting 0.3. And then uh, we strip it down to the core PPI. Uh, we had a rise of three tenths of 1% versus two tenths expected. So uh, inflation at the producer level did come in a little bit hotter than expected this morning. And I'm sure the Fed's watching uh, inflation indications as well. So I think we probably got a couple of things, uh, you know, along with the strength in the economy that's pointing toward higher rates. I think the biggest thing this afternoon is whether the Fed sticks to its plan of anticipating three rate hikes for 2018, or whether we hear them talk about maybe a, a fourth rate hike. Uh, that potentially, you know, could, uh, well, I'm not sure what it'll do for traders. It's always a volatile day uh, in trading in the afternoon when we, uh, you know, get news from the Fed. And if they say something that's a little different from last month and it's not, you know, expected, then clearly we could have some pretty wild moves in, in both directions. And it's not unusual to see that after two o'clock Eastern when the news comes out. So that'll be something I think traders are really focusing on. But you can see here the 10-year Treasury yield today is flat, uh, down just barely uh, at about 2.95%. The past few days, we've been in a very narrow range as the bond market's kind of settled down and everyone awaits the Fed decision. So we'll see what happens here. From a stock market perspective, though, I am really bullish what I'm seeing in the market currently. Uh, we just got a breakout on this is a transportation versus utility uh, ratio. And so essentially what this is telling you when you break out to a new high, it's that we've never seen this level of prices on transportation stocks versus the uh, utility, the Dow Jones utility average. And when you think about it, transportation stocks do very well when the economy is strengthening or expected to strengthen and utilities do the opposite. So when you see this ratio breaking out to an all time high, that tends to favor the bulls. And so, uh, and I'm gonna try and make this chart just a tad bigger here so everybody can see this maybe a little bit better. But this goes back the last two decades. This is not just the last year, this is the last two decades. And we did just recently break out here coming off the lows back in 2016, when the market was really struggling. You can see how the transports were badly lagging utility stocks. But since that time, and throughout this entire bull market run, we have had a huge move up in this ratio. And I think that it continues to point higher. And I think this is good not only for the market, but I think it is projecting a strengthening economy down the road, which is exactly what the Fed's been telling us. Now, toward the bottom of this chart, I have a correlation uh, indicator. And what this is doing is it's tracking the correlation between this ratio that I show up here of transports versus utilities and how that relates to the S&P 500. And anytime you get a correlation reading above zero, that means that there's positive correlation. As you get up closer to one, it means that basically they go hand in hand in the same direction. To the downside, if you go below zero, it means that they're actually moving inversely to one another. And if you happen to get down to minus one, it means it's in a complete inverse correlation. They're moving in exactly opposite directions. And when you look at this ratio, the transports versus utilities, I think it's pretty clear to see that there is a pretty strong uh, positive correlation between the direction of the S&P 500 and the direction of transports versus utilities. So I think this breakout's a pretty significant one because it comes out, it comes on the heels of a breakout in my favorite ratio, which is when I look at the consumer stocks, consumer discretionary, the XLY versus consumer staples, the XLP. And if you look at this one, we have had a huge breakout to the upside in 2018 meaning that a lot more money is rotating into the more aggressive consumer discretionary area. And if you look at the correlation here, it's even stronger with the S&P 500. So I'm not saying the S&P 500 can't go higher from here, but history tells us that with both of these key ratios breaking out to all-time highs right now, this is not the time you want to be out of the stock market. I believe you want to be in. I think you want to be fairly aggressive. Uh, I'm expecting prices to go quite a bit higher. 
I'm going to go back real quick to this transport utility chart because I want you to see what it looked like back in 2000, 1999, it peaked back in the second quarter and was steadily going lower as we entered into the bear market back in the first quarter of 2000, March 2000. And when we were going into 2007, uh, as we, we were breaking to about a 18 month low on this ratio, just as we topped on the S&P 500 in October of 2007. So the way the market works is normally you're gonna see money begin to rotate uh, when expectations are that the economy's slowing down, we might have a recession. Uh, and normally those are cues to maybe grow a little bit more defensive when you're looking at equities. We are not looking at that at all right now. We're breaking out to new highs. And again, I find that to be very bullish. And if we take a look at the XLY, XLP, and we go back, you can see early in 20 or 2000, this ratio was looking pretty good. But as the, when it, we went into that bear market, this ratio collapsed to the downside. And if you look at 2007, it was even more meaningful to me because we had topped a couple years earlier. If you remember, housing was doing really well into 2005, 2006. And then housing started to turn down and just about everything else in consumer discretionary went down with it. And by the time the stock market topped in October 2007, we had already moved in this ratio to a three to four year low. So that's what I would be looking for. This is the exact top rotate to support a big uh, bull market. And so I've, I've said throughout 2018 that the consolidation was just that. It was a correction, temporary correction that we I was fairly certain we were heading higher. We now see the NASDAQ Russell 2000 breaking out to all-time highs, and I'm expecting that to continue, although the summertime can be a bit of a headwind for the market. So maybe we just consolidate, move up a little bit, but I, I, I look forward to a very, very strong fourth quarter as we move forward. A couple of other uh, areas to take a look at today. I do want to mention the NASDAQ because it is breaking to an all-time high. Today, it is up to uh, 77.37 right now, up another 33 and a half points. This was a breakout to an all-time high just last week when it hit 7,700, taking out the mid-March high. I, we had a temporary pullback, starting to move back up again. The PPO shows that price momentum is continuing to accelerate to the upside. I really see little problems here with the NASDAQ, other than at some point we'll get you know, your normal rising 20-day EMA test. I think the NASDAQ looks really strong here. I uh, wanted to go through a couple of, well, several stocks of interest technically that I was looking at earlier. So I thought I would share those with everyone. eBay. Now, when I look at eBay, I'm going to go out a year here. Let's just stre uh, stretch this chart a bit more. When you look at eBay, it has definitely been declining, but I do think that the rising 20-day moving average is going to be an interesting test for the stock, and it did hit that earlier today. Take a look at the trend line that we have that's been uh, developing here over the past few months. Uh, clearly, we're in a downtrend in the short term, but from a longer term perspective, I think things look much better. Uh, we did break out, have a huge move back at uh, end of January 20. Uh, 18, even into early February. Then we pulled back, consolidated, and then looked like we were breaking down. But we are still holding on to these prior lows around $34. Watch for a breakout of this trend line. I think a move back up above 41 on eBay would be worth uh, paying attention to. So eBay was one, I think, worth watching. Autodesk, ADSK, getting very close to a breakout. Volume was light when I was looking earlier today. But you do have a nice uptrend. Looks to me like maybe an ascending triangle, rising bottoms, equal highs coming across. Breakout above 140. We want to see volume coming in. You can see so far, volume pretty light today. So not really anything at this point. I certainly would not get in anticipating the breakout. I would either wait for the breakout or know that you're in this bullish pattern and perhaps a move back down to about 132.5 would be an interesting uh, support level on a pullback. Next up, mentioned... Uh, Fox, 21st Century Fox, FOXA, having a huge day today. This is one when we did chart breakouts about a week ago. I went through a number of breakouts, and then I went uh, through probably five, seven stocks that were on the verge of breakouts. Fox, uh, uh, 21st Century Fox was one of those. Look at all the tops coming across here at 39. We finally made that breakout last week. Look at the volume expanding. This could have been seen technically before 
we got the news today. Uh, and it, again, for me, it's more, it's a poster child of why we like to follow technical analysis. Being a CPA and knowing the fundamental side of things, you can have the financial statements, give me the charts. Um, next up, Danaher. I saw Arthur Hill had written about Danaher in the Don't Ignore This chart blog. And of course, Aaron and I have been talking about it. On this chart, you really don't see it, but I'm gonna stretch it out here in just a second. Look at the equal to highs coming in at 104. We just did, tested it again yesterday. Big volume, we backed off of that level. So we're not quite ready to make the breakout. But if we stretch this chart out again to that one year period, I think you'll be able to see that this ascending triangle here follows a very nice move to the upside. I think DHR looks very bullish. A breakout above 104, in my opinion, with confirming volume. I want to see that volume pick up on the breakout. But on that confirming volume, I think the measurement's about 12 bucks up to about 116 if we can get through 104. So keep an eye on Danaher. Uh, Roku, I will uh, uh, disclose I own this one. This is a key area, and I bring it up because this, I'm watching this one pretty closely today. After gapping down in February on some pretty big volume, this stock has been, been under a lot of uh, accumulation, a lot of interest in the stock as it's made this move. This was earnings related, heavy volume gap up. Pulled back, but notice we're holding this rising 20-day moving average. We've gotten that golden cross back up above the 50. And I think if we break above this 44 area with some uh, gusto, I think this one's got a shot for maybe that 51, 52 area to fill its gap. Next up, EXPR. I'm going to go through some smaller companies with you. EXPR, nice move here to the upside. And the pullback on lighter volume Notice we'd gotten up to, to 10 on this gap up. We pulled all the way back down, hit the 20, and then went through $10. I think this little pullback here, 70 or 80 cents on the stock, actually is testing the support level. I would not be surprised to see some buying come in on EXPR here. OXM, they reported yesterday. Uh, the results were actually pretty good uh, from what I saw. Big breakout, though, prior to the report. So once again, I think we are seeing a lot of buying on the rumor. And now we're seeing some selling on the news. Only thing I don't like about OXM, you know, I like to, to get some volume coming in. I like to see uh, at least an average of two to 300,000 shares on a, on a stock. This one might be a little bit too light in terms of volume for my taste, but I wanted to bring it up because I thought the chart was interesting. EPE, just a few more of these, and then I'm going to turn it over to Rick. Um, EP Energy. Beautiful breakout to the upside. I think this downtrend ended. Look at the volume that came in on this push to the upside. I think we have really good support down around the $2.50 level. The volume has been coming out as we've been consolidating. I wouldn't be surprised to see this begin to fill maybe to the right side of a cup, back up to about that 330, 340 area to challenge the uh, highs that were set just a few weeks ago. NE, another one in the energy space, Noble Drilling. Uh, I like this move to the upside. Nice breakout. We pulled back, I think, five and a quarter to five and a half is pretty good support. Uh, and maybe a move back up. If we can put a hammer in here, this could be equal highs off of this uptrend. Equal highs, rising lows. Could be an ascending triangle. I'd look for a breakout above $6 with some confirming volume there. GTLS, this is uh, Chart Industries. Nice breakout, good volume. This is a nice test of the 20-day moving average with a very strong PPO. I think the price momentum here is very bullish. And so this pullback from 74 or so down to 67 and change could be presenting an opportunity here. Last one, CBL. This is uh, CBL and Associates. Yesterday's candle was very bullish, or excuse me, very bearish. I don't like that uh, inverted hammer uh, right at a key resistance level. A lot of times on the show, I'm showing a six-month chart. If I go back and show you the six-month chart, you probably look a little differently at this stock. You probably think, wow, we got a nice move here. PPO looks good. Uh, maybe we're going to pull back off of that reversing candle, but otherwise it looks good. That's why I think sometimes stretching out, looking at a longer-term chart makes sense. Here's one year, but this was a major gap down. We have not been able to get through $6 since this huge gap down on heavy volume. We're talking over 35 million shares on this move lower. Today, we have 2.6 million. Uh, yesterday, we had 10 million, way, way below what we saw there. Had an intraday breakout, and we failed. That bothers me. I wouldn't be surprised to see at least a 20-day test here on CBL on the pullback. Okay, uh, let's continue to move on. We've got a great guest today. 
We've got Rick Bensignor with us, and uh, it's always great to have guests on. And I know you've got a uh, an awesome background in the uh, financial services industry, Rick. And everyone's been uh, waiting patiently for your presentation. What do you have for us today? Well, Tom, we're going to look at some of the most important things any trader or investor needs to prepare with and the approach they need to take in order to set themselves up for much higher odds of success. And what's interesting is we'll, we'll take a look through this. Um, and as we do it, um, the interesting thing is that you can be an advanced trader and someone who is quite sophisticated and yet sometimes forgets the most simplest of things to do to uh, ensure or, or simply up the odds that what you're doing is, is correct. So we'll go through this uh, slide deck and, and what we're going to do is um, try to make our way through this rather quickly because we have a bunch of slides. We'll try to get this done in 15 minutes or give or take and then leave plenty of time for Q&A. So um, let's, let's uh, start this off with a basic question and kind of how you approach things. Let's assume you've done some type of fundamental research. Uh, you kind of know what you want to do in the stock and we'll assume it's a stock, but it can be anything in any of the asset classes. But once you've, you've kind of got your security lined up, um, I think the single most important question to ask yourself is, is my intention here that this is going to be a trade or is it a longer term investment? And it's critical that you've got to know the answer to this at the time that you commit capital. Um, it's certainly less likely that if you've got a profitable trade, it's going to become a long-term investment. But it's very likely that if you intended to get into a trade and it's not working out and it's going against you, you might very well say, oh, well, yeah, this was intended to be an investment. And that's one of the worst things you can do to yourself from a money management perspective. So I want to walk you through what I think are five critical steps um, in order to really line up your trades right and, and really up the odds that what you're doing is correct, um, to really give yourself a chance. And then when you think about, many people say it's a 50-50 flip of a coin whether or not a trade works because it either goes up or it goes down. Um, I don't like to think of terms in the market as a 50-50 trade. First of all, we know that over time, stocks move up. If you look at any long-term chart of the Dow or the S&P, you look back 50 years, you look back 100 years, basically that chart's going to start on the lower left-hand corner and end on the upper right-hand corner. So it's really not a 50-50 flip of a coin in the sense that over time, most stocks move higher. Um, what step number one is about is making sure that the time frame that you're going to analyze matches the intended holding period. And the, and the key thing here is you don't want to mismatch um, a trade with analysis that you would do for an investment and vice versa. So um, you're not going to want to look at long-term charts if you're planning on holding a stock for a couple of weeks and conversely, you don't want to look at an intraday chart and try to find a breakout if your intention is to hold the stock as an investment for multi, multi months, if not years. So let's look at this in terms of a chart. Um, here's your long term chart of Walmart, it's a monthly chart. And you can notice that from basically 2000 to 2012. Walmart traded in a range, and then at the very beginning of 2012, it broke out towards the upside. And this is a name that I myself actually bought in my personal account at $64 and change back in 2012. And I can tell you that I didn't spend much time at all trying to figure out entry. I looked at this, I assumed that at this point, it was very likely that it was going to take out the all-time high from 1999. Um, so I wasn't spending any time on, on figuring out where's the best entry. I didn't care if I paid 63 and a half or 64, 64 and a half. I had a feeling that this thing was going to move. Um, so I, again, I'm not going to waste my time 
looking to really perfectly define the entry on something that really should move. And, and just kind of as an aside here, uh, obviously it moved up to 80 bucks, or actually that's $90 before it fell down. And then moved back down into the range that caught the 200 week moving average, or actually it's 200 month moving average. I actually got my wife into it. I suggested to her to buy it there. So she actually ended up with better entry than I did. Although I had sold half out at 75. Um, it's, it's the type of thing that, but more importantly, is I matched my time frame to my analysis and spent very little time on actual entry. On the flip side of this is, let's say you're trading a name like Micron, and you notice that uh, back on May 31st, this gap lower, um, and then twice tested that high near, uh, let's say, 60 and a quarter. You had one more decline on the open of... Uh, I guess this was June 8th. Uh, and then we started breaking out towards the upside. And once we took out the triple high, to me, as a trader, that's your clue that you're going to likely move higher, especially with the spike down it had to start the day that got totally rejected, basically held below from two days before it turned around and went straight back up. So you notice, too, that you've got a big gap. And as a trader, after three attempts up, you're – your target should be the high end of the gap, which is exactly where this went to. And then it's pulled back. And in fact, over the last couple of days, we've kind of bottomed back against what had been the breakout point. So you can see as a trader, you want to use short-term charts and want to match my analysis to the type trade intention I have. If I'm investing long-term in Micron, I'm wasting time looking at a 15-minute chart and trying to perfectly identify where entry is. So the most important thing here is to match your analysis with the type trade that you intend to have. Is it a trade or is it an investment? Step two, determine the prevailing trend direction and key support and resistance levels. Now, I'm going to tell you that it's not always as easy to simply look to see if price is moving higher or lower to say, is this trending higher or not? Um, I always suggest that you find some type of model that helps take your own bias out of the equation. Uh, so it's not simply you looking at a chart and saying, oh, this is a bull market or not. Uh, a, a model that doesn't care how you think, but actually in and of itself creates bullish or bearish structure, I think is, is a helpful tool. So. This is a chart of gold that uh, I put into the slide deck earlier this morning. And if I ask you the question, is this a bullish chart or a bearish chart? I'm going to tell you, you're going to have a difficult time answering it. So let's add a little bit of analytics on to see if we can help. So taking the same chart, now we've drawn a few trend lines. You can see, obviously, gold has spent 2018 in a channel until a few weeks ago where it broke down. But we're still holding on to, including today, the longer term uptrend. So as this analysis, you ask yourself, is this a bullish chart or should I play it bearishly? And I'll tell you, you probably still don't have the answer even doing this simple type analysis. So now what I want to do is add something like the cloud chart on, which is one of my favorite indicators to help tell me the structure of a market. But still in this daily time frame, and by the way, on top where it says DC, that's daily continuous. So this is a, a rolling futures contract on a daily basis. Even this is somewhat unclear. Short term, the chart will tell you from, from the cloud chart that you're in a bearish market. But because the cloud itself has flipped so many times over the last few months, even that, I will tell you, indicates that it's choppy, and I give less credence to actually still being able to identify if we're in a bullish or bearish market. So I'm forced to essentially go out to a weekly chart. Now, if I look at a weekly chart, I can see not only did the, the cloud chart very well define the up moves from 2009 to 2012, and it got bearish in 2013, and then bullish again in 2016. If I blow this up to look more closely, I will tell you that gold is in, at least in the medium term, my perspective would be that you're still in a bull market despite the fact that it is top multiple times north of 1360. Uh, the structure of the cloud chart, again, something objective, suggests that we're still in a bull market 
in a bigger picture and would be until you got down to maybe something like 1240 or so, another 50 bucks, give or take $60 from where we are now. So again, I'm going to flip back to, it's really important to determine what's the prevailing trend. And you do that because now we go to step three. Once you've concluded, are, am I trading or am I putting on an investment? And secondly, what's the prevailing trend and where are support and resistance levels? Now I can decide what are the most sensible technical indicators to use for the present market mode? Meaning, am I going to use trending models that help me define trends? And if we're in a trending market, I'm going to want to use that. Or are we in a sideways market that's not really going anywhere? In which case, I want to use models that help me define um, more accurately highs and lows of non-trending markets, things like oscillators. So I want to show you a chart that I've shown multiple times in the last couple of years at lots of presentations I've done and conferences I've spoken at. This is the S&P uh, from most of it, let's say 2014 through the fall of 2016. And obviously we had multiple lows just north of 1800. That's the lower horizontal green line. Uh, so that had helped support. We broke out in the summer of 2016 to new highs. And then that dip you see uh, on the far right side of the chart is going into elections, the presidential elections in 2016. So on the breakdown back beneath support, um, many technicians on the street called for the high being in place at 2200 or so, and that this was breaking down. Um, and it shouldn't have done that, and it shouldn't have taken out that prior uh, support level, which used to be resistance at uh, 22 and change. Uh, I'm sorry, 21 and change. And uh, a lot of people got negative on this. Now you get the election results and right away, um, obviously election night, market got hit very hard, but it, it, it crawled back. And by the next day or two, this thing started moving to the upside, right? I would suggest to you that that was a clear indication that trend had not in fact changed. We were back to essentially what had been the all time highs just within days after the election. And that most likely you wanna play this as a trend. And obviously, if we look at the results since then and we focus again on election week in the middle of the chart, you know how much this has moved up since. Um, so we look at 2017, you have a pure up market. I purposely included RSI and MACD beneath this chart to show you just how poorly you would have done if you listened to the RSI to tell you you were overbought and should not be involved. And if you look and kind of really understand how MACD works, MACD never got a buy signal throughout the entire up move. Um, there are signals that would tell you not to be short, but you never got a pure buy signal. And even over the last few weeks, the crossing of the blue line above the red line is not a pure MACD buy signal because it came from north of the zero line. So again, it's another indication not to be bearish. And chances are in a long-term bull market not to be bearish probably means you can be bullish. Um, but using oscillators in a trending market had not been helpful, certainly from the latter part of 2016 and into 2017. Um, so again, the, the whole point here is know which type mode you're in and use the right type models for it. Any type trend following model, whether it's moving averages, it's Shimoku, anything that you like, EDX, um, that is, is going to help define trend and that you're actually in a trend is the is the next logical step to use once you define that it's that the breakout, the false breakdown from election night and the move within two, three weeks right away to new all-time highs was your clue that this was resuming a new uptrend and forget what the oscillators are telling you and instead play the trend. Step number four of the five, determine achievable price targets. And when you and then actually reduce or completely exit your trade when you get there. And the little subheading here, read this, this is important. If you buy a stock at 40 and you said for all the different analysis you do, your target is $50, 
And then you do nothing when it hits 50 because the stock looks so great then that you think it's going to 55 or 60. Nothing worse to you, to your P&L, and to your psyche to see a trade 51 and then plunk down to 45 because you got greedy and you did nothing when you achieved your price target. It's really important that you determine achievable price targets at the time you get into a trade, and then when you get there, take money off the table. Here's an example of a trade we put on for clients in 2016. Um, in September or early October, kind of the middle of the chart, there's, um, there's a DeMarc model running on here called sequential, and this is the setup count. So the nine count that you see in yellow up against the top of the Ichimoku cloud was a place we got short. So we actually sold the high of the move in TLT, but this was only intended to be a trade. And we were out of it by the time we got the nine down, um, just essentially nine weeks later. And I've had people say to me, you know, you, you had the perfect sale in bonds and the TLT is now trading, uh, you know, much lower. And it's, it's, it's actually probably right now, TLT is at 119 and change. It's not a heck of a lot lower than this chart is showing, but this chart only takes you into the latter part of 2016. It fell much more before bouncing. And my response was, this was only intended to be a trade. I did not put this on as an investment. So when I achieved my downside target, I took it. And I don't kick myself in the butt for saying, oh, you missed all this. It was never my intention to be short for a mega move. I, I saw a very clear place to put on a low risk short. I covered at the intended cover point, and that was it, trade done. I can always get back in, but the point is when I hit my targets, I took my profits. Here's the dollar index. Now, this is probably the best macro call we've had this year. We've been telling clients for months that in between 89 uh, and 90 and a half to cover shorts and aggressive traders go long for a 94.20 target. And we got that with virtually no drawdown. We picked the bottom to the move. And we hit our target a couple weeks ago. And that's it. I'm out. We're out at 94.20. We essentially bought the low of the year and sold, for all practical purposes, the high of the year. That's it. I will reanalyze. I will figure out where I'm more interested in coming back to the dollar. If I'm correct in this five-wave move down, right, this is probably, and it's questionable whether or not we just didn't need BC and the recent high was the C, or if this was just simply the A, we pull back and still have one more move. Nonetheless, I can tell you right here, right now, I'm not interested in being long the dollar. I hit my target. I'll wait for a pullback before I decide if I want to come in. Most important thing is I set a target. We achieved our target. We took our profits. The last step goes a little bit more into the psychology uh, side of things, and that is when your gut instinct first, and I highlight first, tells you that your trade is likely wrong, right? Your body's incredible advanced warning protection system is your gut instinct. Think of it as your AWACS system. When it tells you something's wrong with the trade you've put it on, when if, it, if you were to react when it first tells you that and get out of the trade, despite the fact that you might have bought something and a week later you're kicking it out, and yes, you have to come to the fact that you made a mistake and you're losing money, if you if you listen to your gut, your gut knows better than virtually anything else if the trade you've gotten into is the right thing or not. In the long run, if you get out, as soon as your body tells you something's not right here, you will likely save a vast amount of money and emotional turmoil that you have from trading. Both are really important things to, to have uh, conquered to be a successful trader. Right? So you don't want emotional turmoil. You don't want financial suffering. Listen to your gut. It knows best. So again, to recap, make sure the chart timeframes you're analyzing match the intended holding period. Figure out the prevailing trend and where the support and resistance levels are. Determine are you using trend following models or oscillators that eventually, essentially fight trend to analyze the market. Figure out what your price targets are when you get them. 
at minimally at minimum reduce right take profits or completely exit your trade and when your gut instinct first tells you that your trade is likely wrong listen to your body and get out of the trade in 2017 doing all these things we put up in the note trader which is which is the service I have for individual clients. Most of what I do or I consult to uh, Wall Street institutions. Um, but I also have uh, a, a retail piece, uh, a division of the whole Bensinger group. It's called In the No Trader. You can go to inthenotrader.com to learn more, to learn more. Last year we put on 39 trades. We accumulated total profit and internal rate of return of 75%. We used no leverage ETFs. This is a pure accumulation of profits over the 39 trades. Notice here on the right-hand side, the profit factor 6.67. That means you make $6.67 following our trades for every dollar you lost. Um, and on the left-hand side in the middle, look at the drawdown. 62% of all trades had drawdown of 0.5% or less, 41% of all trades had drawn down of 0.1% or less. It essentially means we had impeccable timing. And this does not include the option trades, in which case we only put out two last year, but we made 260% on those. If I look at how we just, well, here, we just launched a brand new um, individual investor product called the Tactical Trader. It gives you the same information that I give on the U.S. equity markets to my institutional clients, um, it focuses on the, the in, individual investor piece. Um, only we'll do ETFs, unlike what I do for institutions. Um, we try to choose ETFs from the top 100 most liquid ones. You can get this for as low as 99 a month if you sign up for an entire year and pay it once. Otherwise, it's 129 a month, month to month. And what I'll do is a special uh, code. If you go to sign up and use the promo code stock charts, I will guarantee this price of either 99 or 129 for the next three years, regardless of how much I raise the price for the individual product. So that's something I can offer you. Year to day, we just started the Tactical Trader Report April 5th. We've put out seven trades of which uh, five of them are closed and we're up 12.53% in that time. Notice first four trades had max drawdown zero. Every one we got into never closed a single day against us. Uh, we've got a few positions on now. So again, you can go to In the No Trader, hit up the sign up tab. It looks like this. Choose either the top tab at 129 a month, and that's month by month, or you can pay uh, the equivalent of 99 a month if you pay annually. So we'll bill you one time of 1188. And again, don't forget to put in the promo code. Promo code. And that is it for me. I will pass it back to Tom and Aaron for questions. Well, I have a question, but I'm going to first see uh, Aaron. Do you have any from the uh, chat room? Yes, we absolutely do. Um, one I thought was really interesting is that have you have you ever thought about you know once you hit a target moving to a trailing stop instead? I mean, would that be a, a good strategy? You could certainly trail a stop. I typically like the idea of taking something off the table um, when I hit my target, and generally I'm in the neighborhoods of fifty percent at a minimum. Yes, I can trail a stop. Um, you've got to have really good reasons to think that your stock or your investment, whatever it is, your trade is really going to uh, increase substantially and it has nothing to do with anything you see on TV. Uh, you read in the newspaper, it needs to be because your analysis has changed such that if you were going to first put capital into play right then and there, you'd have a higher target. If you're not comfortable buying at the same price that you were originally looking to sell, then you should be selling. Ah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, the other was, you know, how do you define, I, I'm sure it's just a matter of individual's analysis, but, you know, how do you really define what an achievable price target is or, or what a good stop is if you're a trend follower or swing trader? 
So here's where some of the experience I have is, is very different than a lot of people on the streets and certainly a lot of the individual investors. Stop losses, putting in a proper stop loss, takes as much talent, uh, if not more talent, than getting into your trader initially. Um, I rarely will ever have a stop loss at an obvious point that I know other people are looking at. So I don't stop myself out under, you know, last week's low. I don't do anything that is obvious, but it still needs to be within the context of what makes sense for my investment. So we don't have time today to go into how I come up with them, but there's certain mathematical uh, relationships that I can look at about price movement that can help me figure out proper stop. Um, so on, on the stop side, that's how I can answer the question. As far as what are logical targets, um, let me see if I can go back to a slide. Um, let me see which one it was. Well, here, I think it was. Can you see, can you guys see this? Is my screen back on? Uh, no, you'll have to share. You have to share your okay. screen. Okay. Uh, I'm looking for the share, uh, share screen. Uh, yeah, it should be a green button toward the bottom. There you go. Okay. Did it come back? Yes. Yep. Okay. So this is a model. This is that dollar index trade. There's a model I use that basically said that when the price of the dollar index properly hurdled where those kind of green upward arrows were, just above the consolidation at the bottom, it would target the teal color. So this, this is a model called TD propulsion. Um, it works on the physics of price movement. And this is one of the ways I can come up with a target um, that's way in advance of ever seeing price move it, because it already gives me the levels that need to, that if, you know, if we pass through A, there should be enough momentum to get to B. And that's, that's one of the ways. Ichimoku, the, the cloud charts are a very good way of establish, establishing price targets too, because unlike almost any other technical indicator, Ichimoku looks forward in time 26 price bars. And, and plots already forward in time. So if you're talking a daily chart, you, you've got 26 days ahead. If you're looking at a weekly chart, you already know six months beforehand where important support and resistance can be. So that's how I come up with achievable targets. Okay. That's all I had from the chat room at this point. I kind of uh, consolidated all those questions. Tom, did you have anything? Yeah, I've got one question. Um, and maybe while we're going over it, uh, if we can bring up that poll again, so we can kind of close out with that in just a minute. Um, but uh, yeah, my question is, you were talking earlier about, you know, using if you're if you're a fairly short term trader, you don't want to be pulling up a monthly chart to try to determine where you're going to get into a stock or right. if you're a long term investor. You know, going to a 15 minute chart probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, I guess, you know, from my perspective, when I'm looking to get into a trade, I almost always enter based on either an hourly or daily chart, typically a daily chart. I'm more I'm a swing trader. I tend to mm -hmm. hold, I tend to hold anywhere from I mean, it could be one or two days if things go against me and I have to get out or I have a quick trip up to my target. But normally I would say it's a few weeks to a month is kind of like my my normal holding period. Now, when I look at my daily charts, I will many times go back to a weekly chart just as confirmation of maybe the overall trend to the upside to make sure I'm trading in the right direction with the longer term chart direction, even though I'm, I'm actually using the daily chart to pick out my entry points. Do you do that or do you simply stick with that daily chart for swing trading? I, th I think for swing trading, because I, I identify swing trading as typically something in the few weeks uh, to maybe a month, a month and a half time frame. It's, it's, I think of swing trading as really trying to take advantage of whatever the, like the next move is. Um, and I think because of that time element, 
that is the typical holding period. Um, looking out at longer term charts, um, can you, you kind of want to know what they say, but if you're, think of it this way, you, you have a solid uptrend over time, but you have enough evidence to think that for the next month, this stock's pulling back. It's already started to you know, show some signs of, of weariness. It's starting to break down. You say, if it takes out this level, I want to get short, you get short. You know you're shorting something that in a longer term time frame is bullish, but if your analysis is correct and this thing still has a few weeks more of pressure to go, you play, you, you pay attention to your daily chart, you look for what your targets are. Um, it's possible some type of target comes in from a, a weekly chart, but my guess is the daily chart will probably give you what you need, if not even a 120 minute chart or something that you know, gives you, 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 you can look back a month or so and find prior low or, or draw a trend line or do something to, to create a target. Okay, fair enough. Uh, I do wanna point everyone to the uh, poll. This was interesting. I've, I found one of these answers to be very interesting and that is the 12% that said none of the above. Right, I, I noticed that too. All right, so that's about yeah. eight people. That's about eighteen people that responded. That's not using any of these things to get out of a trade. And I would like to now add like a blank as to what they're using if they're not using any of these. Uh, maybe they're long-term holders and they don't. Yeah, they don't. I them. I was thinking too. Some people honestly don't set stops and targets, you know. So yet they must have something that helps them decide if they don't use well, the, the gut. <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you what I think they use. They use the fact that they know over 100 years the market moves up. There are people who are simply, they are only buyers of stocks. They do not sell. Um, their view is the, the asset class equities is always a long-term hold. And even if it doesn't work for 10 years, if, if you're a long-term holder, it will come back. And history has proven that. Um, so, you know, I think if, if the people who, who signed in for none of the above um, are, are truly there and have read through the question, <laughs> then my guess is it, nothing's a trade. It's all an investment and, uh, and you simply don't get out. Yeah, that makes and sense. And you hope that, you know, three quarters of your names go up and way outpace the few that don't. Yeah, personally, I think if that was an ETF, you know, a diversified ETF, I'd be okay with that strategy, I think, because you're right. I mean, I'm a historian and obviously the markets come up a long way and occasionally we go through bear markets, but we always come back out and move to higher highs. So that would be okay for me for an ETF. But when you look at individual names, I mean, there have been some big companies over the years, not many, but there have been some big companies over the years that have really uh, fallen apart. And, um, you know, a lot of big names that maybe weren't around for a long time, but a lot of those uh, dot com names from back in 2000. Sure. Know. Or the old standard, you know, General Electric. I mean, that one. Yep. 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 Um, it's, it's true. And you, you can think of, I mean, there's so many names go back to, uh, I think, pre split Yahoo's all time high was, or maybe it was even post split, 250. And it went from 250 down to $9. Yeah. And, you know, it, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's painful. Uh, yeah. Um, and look, there's some analysts on the street who won't downgrade their names no matter what they do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's why you want to have some general sense of fundamental analysis, but I never pay too much attention um, to them other than when you find an analyst who has downgraded a stock after taking a really bad loss, let's say they get you in at 60 bucks a share and they're puking it out at 35 and they're kind of the last guy on the street who hasn't already turned it into a hold or a sale. Generally, I'll wait 48 to 72 hours after that and buy the stock because they almost always have sold the absolute bottom. Mm -hmm. um, you know, before you go, somebody had asked what the... Uh, what your model name is that you use? Is it just a personal one or do you have a name for it? Um, the model name I use, well, um, <laughs> I use multiple models. Um, I mean, my, it's, it's, 
when, when the person's asking what's the model name, are they talking about, for instance, that, that dollar index chart that gave us, you know, targets? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So that's actually a model from a gentleman named Tom DeMarc. Uh, it's the propulsion model. And to access, the thing is, DeMarc's models um, are not free anywhere. Um, they're 500 bucks a month. So you need to be a serious you know, investor slash trader uh, to invest in them. They're definitely part of my repertoire. Uh, I use other models besides Tom's, but Tom's models are, are often very helpful to me. So um, as somebody who is a consultant to institutions and uh, I'm talking with them all day long, um, I want to know what some of those models are saying. Um, but if, if, if you were to ask me, like, what am I most, when I pull up a chart, what am I always looking at? I'll have a uh, DeMarc sequential count. I'll have a DeMarc propulsion overlay. I will have Ichimoku, which is the cloud charts. Um, and generally, I'll have a MACD chart running on the bottom. And then again, I'll, I, I don't make trade decisions for MACD. But if I'm already looking to get bullish, and MACD has stopped going down and is very short to, to uh, shortly to, to turn positive. I may already go after it, or I may wait for MACD to, to confirm, but I'm never going to buy something just because MACD says, oh, it's a buy. Mm -hmm. I've got to have my own reasons. I don't believe enough in any of the technical indicators that in and of themselves that you're going to make money in the long run simply trading an individual indicator. Right. And I think something like RSI will prove that to you. Do you know that Larry Williams um, had um, years ago figured out that when, when the RSI gets to, let's say, 70, it's often the best time to be a buyer. Whereas most people will read a textbook or take a class on technical analysis and learn that, you know, you want to sell it when it gets overbought and buy it when it gets oversold. It's not true at all. Mm -hmm. You have to know what market mode you're in. In a sideways market, sure, sell the you know moves above 75, buy the moves beneath 25. In a trending market, let's say you have an upward trending market, I couldn't care less that our side is overbought. I'll only care if it gets oversold. Then it's probably I want to find reasons to be a buyer. Mm -hmm. Right. But in an upward trending market, your R side should be overbought most of the time. If it's a good, solid, strong market, RSI should be very high. And if you're getting out of your trades because RSI is hitting that, you're missing a ton of upside action. You've yeah. got to know what the indicators actually are intended to do. No doubt about it. Certainly all of these indicators, and like you said, many of these indicators really shouldn't be your go-to when it comes time to pull the trigger to buy or sell. No. really just be secondary type indicators. Absolutely, Tom. But uh, anyway, it's, it was absolutely wonderful having you on the show today, Rick. We certainly, uh, um, you know, it was a pleasure for us to have you. And we'd, we'd like to get you back sometime if your schedule frees up. I'd be happy to come back, guys. It's a pleasure to share. I love educating people and uh, I'm always happy to come back. Awesome. Thanks again. Yes. And uh, Aaron, if you are ready, mm. let's go ahead and move on to the 10 and 10. Absolutely. I'm going to grab this. Okay. We had 34 requests today. Uh, since we're running a little late, I won't run the RRG, but remember, go ahead and like the symbols uh, because the top uh, symbol getter, uh, vote getter is going to be the second symbol, whether we looked at it yesterday or not. Uh, in fact, Cisco, which I believe we looked at yesterday, is currently at the top with Netflix and Honeywell. All right. Keep well, voting. And right now we'll start with uh, Michael's, M-I-K. Yeah, the one thing I noticed on Michael's when I pulled up the long-term chart is that it just seems to have these periods um, for weeks where it goes higher and then just completely falls apart. And so, you know, now we're into a period where we're getting some nice volume coming in. It is starting to move up. But I just have to question how far it's going to go. It has a history of disappointing traders after a move to the upside. I think there are a lot of other stocks in this space that are much better and probably more reliable. So even though it's strong and looks good, I think I would pass on it just because of its history. All right. And the most popular, 
Wow, it looks like we still have a tie. I am going to go with uh, H O N. I believe that's Honeywell, right? It is Honeywell. It is. Um, you know, Honeywell is one of these multinational companies, and they've just been under pressure because of the dollar strength that we've seen over the past few months. Uh, we're starting to see a little bit better action in the S and P and in uh, you know these bigger companies like Honeywell, and I think part of it as uh, Rick mentioned, is the dollar pulling back off of that key resistance level around 95 on the US dollar index. So I think that this in the near term looks pretty good. I think there are a lot of other stocks that look better. Uh, I am still in the uh, camp that thinks the dollar is going to go higher and that we will eventually break above that 95 level. So I think on a relative basis, we may continue to see some weakness on Honeywell. I would really like to see more volume as we try to take out this 152 area. So far, it's just been kind of average. So look for that in the uh, days and weeks ahead. All right. How about uh, from the industrial sector, building materials, Vulcan, VMC? Uh, let's see. We've got a possible, I'm going to go out a little further here because I think what we want to see is whether or not this potentially could be a, an inverse head and shoulder. Now, what you want to see is a rise and then left shoulder, neckline, head, right side of the neckline. You don't want to see the inverse head going below the prior uptrend. Uh, you really shouldn't see that inverse head come down more than 50% of the prior uptrend. So this is not any kind of a bullish pattern that I would pay attention to, although I do like the fact that it's been moving higher. If there's one issue that I have here, it's probably as we've been moving up recently, we're doing so with a lower PPO. So you can see this negative divergence also starting to leave some tails at the top here as we approach what I think could be a key area of resistance just above 132 and a half. We actually touched that level today and look at the volume starting to drift lower on this move up with a negative divergence. So I've got some issues here with VMC. I think there are uh, better opportunities out there. All right. Uh, you know, we haven't looked at it in over a week. How about we do Netflix? All right. Netflix is uh, just a tremendous performer. It's in the specialty retail space, which just continues to break out. And so does Netflix. Today's action is exactly what you want to see. It's hard to sell a stock that is moving higher and doing so, breaking out with uh, clearly better than average volume. And that's exactly what we have here today. We're just a little past the halfway point of the day, and already Netflix has traded 11 million shares. Looks like we're probably going to head for maybe 20 million shares or so, and you can see that is on the upper end of high volume, very heavy volume for Netflix. So I love the breakout. I love really everything about the stock, and I think this really speaks to the point that Rick was making earlier. When you get a stock that is in an uptrend, it routinely goes overbought. doesn't mean that it's a terrible stock. I think when you're overbought for a period of time, you certainly can see a short-term pullback to get some relief. But this, the overbought conditions, this is not a long-term type of a sell signal. And Netflix, I think, really proves that. Another breakout, I think it looks great. All right. How about Adobe? Yeah, Adobe was breaking out earlier, and it's in that key software space. So it's going to be, I'm going to be hard-pressed to find anything negative here. Maybe a little bit of a negative divergence on the breakout, but we've seen the PPO go so much higher. Uh, we've got to give this one a chance to run to the upside. Perhaps the biggest thing for me, as long as it stays in this uptrending character that it has right now, and I think we could probably draw a line, something like this. Um, I think as long as we hold about 230 to 240 on Adobe in this range over here, I'm fine with it. It is in a great part of the market, so I'm bullish Adobe. All right. Uh, something different, a uh, medical supplies company, uh, Kydel, Kydel, Q-D-E-L. Yeah, another one's got a beautiful uptrend in play, and it is in healthcare, which I like. Um, so I don't really have anything negative to say here. I think in the short term, maybe keep an eye on this uh, trend right in here. So if perhaps we lost around the $60 level, that might be a little bit more of a warning sign. Uh, on the stock. But right now, I think it's uh, full speed ahead. I still like the group and I like the stock. All right. Uh, I thought this one had an interesting breakout. Yandex, Y-N-D-X. Uh, yeah, it's breaking out of, oh, I don't like today's candle. This, I'd be careful maybe for possible head fake. fake. Watch that rising 20-day moving average 
on any pullback to the uh, back to the downside because you've got the top of gap resistance up there just above 39. Here you can see uh, we've got some pretty key overhead resistance that we cleared yesterday. Volume picked up a little, but it wasn't exactly huge. And now we're getting a possible reversal. I would just pay attention. We've got the PPO crossover, the center line. So we should hold this rising 20 day moving average on any pullback. If we fail to hold that, then the overall downtrend that occurred back on very heavy volume in April could be resuming. So I would just kind of pay attention to that. I think a rising tide lifts most boats, if not all boats. So this one could be benefiting from it. Um, if we can get back up to the high earlier today, I think that would be a good short-term sign. All right. How about Bristol Myers, BMY? All right, BMY. Oh boy, no, I don't like a bear flag like this. And it's, it's it moved up to fifty four thirty earlier today. Now it's fifty three seventy three. It's leaving this tail potentially above the fifty day moving average. Um, whew. you know, a lot of times when you get a stock that's got a PPO in negative territory, you'll have enough strength from time to time to move it back up to the fifty day and get close to that uh, center line resistance. And I just want to point out that that's exactly where we are, the PPO center line, right here. You want to be careful if that begins to roll back over and we leave a tail above the 50 and move back down below that 20 day moving average, I would be careful. I do not like the volume trends on this stock at all. This was a huge move down. This is a flagpole. This is a little bit of flag action. I would be careful with uh, Bristol Myers. Okay, uh, Procter & Gamble, PG. All right, in the consumer staple space. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Well, we're kind of reversing at gap resistance. This is, uh, you know, if you're trading um, consumer staple stocks, this is a group that's been underperforming the S&P 500 by a very wide margin. And so it's hard to outperform the benchmark S&P if this is the group that you're trying to do it with. We did move just slightly above gap resistance, but look at all the selling that went on for about five days when the stock fell from 78 to 72. Looks to me like a lot of distribution. We did move back up on some nice volume, but we haven't cleared any major area of resistance. I would even say maybe up closer to about, now let's go up to that, that high. I'm gonna say between 77 and a half and maybe 78 and three quarters is where I would watch for resistance here. That's where we're reversing right now. PPO, we got that positive cross, but we had it once before back in December. And once we turned and rolled back over and lost that 20-day, things got ugly again. So watch to the downside. Watch that rising 20-day moving average. As long as it holds it, you could hang on. But I would be careful if we fell back below it. All right. And our final one, what are you thinking about emerging markets? Uh, let's look at that ETF, EEM. Well, I mean, I think we're consolidating um, off of the move higher. You can see the early February dive. So far, that level is holding. I really would like to see that level continue to hold. So I do think as you get closer to that low, we tested it just about uh, maybe two weeks ago. The, the closer you're, you are to 45, the better. I like this um, from a reward to risk standpoint. But you can see there really hasn't been a whole lot of strength recently. We are still trading down closer to the low than we are the high. And while the market here in the U.S. continues to move higher, across most of our major indices. So on a relative basis, it's not performing well, but so far holding support. So I've got a mixed picture here. Close below $45, I'd be really careful. Otherwise, to the upside, I'd look for a breakout over 47. All right, and that concludes the 10 and 10. Here are a list of these symbols that we went over. I will get these up in the Market Watchers Live blog uh, after the show. So you can go there and get all those annotations, copy those charts, whatever you'd like from the Market Watchers Live chart list in the Market Watchers Live blog. All right. And something we're going to talk about, as we always do about this time of day, ChartCon is coming up August 10th and 11th. We are proud to announce that theme, Reducing Risk in Uncharted Waters. And I know that uh, the guest speakers, uh, myself and, and Tom and others, were asked to give our final titles for our conference presentations. So you might want to go and check out what we're going to be talking about. I think there's some excellent information there. So go on to stockcharts.com slash 
ChartCon to get all the information you need about ChartCon. Let's go ahead and move into our final market update. Really interesting movement right now that's happened in uh, during the show, actually. So I thought we would look at the candle glance here for some of these major markets and indexes. The Dow is now in negative territory. We can see the S&P is flirting with moving into negative territory. Not quite there. It did dip in there for a little bit. NASDAQ still holding on, not looking too bad. Uh, it's paired back uh, probably half of the gains today. But look at the uh, S&P 400, uh, just really took a dive. I thought that was interesting to see. And Russell 2000, same. Canadian market, same, taking a dive right now. Uh, I don't know if it has anything to do with the prep and prep for you know those uh, Fed minutes that are going to come out. Uh, we'll have to see. But interesting how we ended up with a pretty much a really deep decline already now in the mid caps and small caps, which have been showing some pretty good relative strength. You can see treasury yields are unchanged, currently reading 2.957. EUP is down on the day, gap down a little bit in the morning, and it's continuing lower. Uh, we're sitting at 24.66 right now. Commodities have moved higher, and you can see that oil is breaking out again to another intraday high, currently reading 13.49 for USO. Gold is up, not a surprise, seeing that the dollar is down. Uh, we're, we're seeing GLD uh, up 17 cents to 122.99. And the VIX is, you know, it declined a bit, but I'm guessing with the the uh, price declines we're now seeing in the mid caps and small caps, that might uh, account for the rise now in the VIX, but we're still at a reading of uh, 12.29, so not too high anyhow. And that's all I have for our final market update. And with that, Tom, I think it's time to start our final segment here, the scooter reports. We haven't done that in a while. What are you, what are you seeing, or would you like me to go ahead first? No, you got the screen. Go ahead and uh, show it. Right. All right. So I am simply going to go to our member dashboard uh, because I want to look at the scooters, but I'm going to start with the technical rankings in terms of what the top 10, low 10, you know, the big movers currently and uh from the top and the bottom. So I think what I would I wanted to look at first was, you know, you can separate these reports by, you know, whether the capitalization, but also uh, the ETFs. And I'm going to show the ETFs. I don't generally do this. I'm going to go into candle glance because, as you can see, very thinly traded uh, ETFs generally make these lists. However, I did notice that UNG was one of those. And so I thought we would take a quick look at the Natural Gas Fund, UNG. And I think it looks quite interesting. Tom and I always use that, that, uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, adjective to explain charts that, you know, maybe are looking to have a breakout or something good happening to it. Uh, I've traded UNG quite a bit and uh, I actually have gotten burned way too many times. But I have to say that I like, you know, we're at the top of this consolidation zone. Haven't quite tapped up above that 200-day EMA. But look at the, the PMO, you know, barely kissed that line uh, with a, what I would call a bull kiss. And now it's starting to move back up uh, with a slight pullback there. Uh, you know, it's been pretty interesting with all these gaps. But it looks like it's about ready to pop out for a breakout. And there you go. You can see how the scooter has just been taking off since uh, early June, actually. So I thought we'd look at that one. But I, as I said, when I took a look at that candle glance, uh, it, it's just too, you can see that they're just too many thinly traded uh, ETFs that do pop up on here. But I think it's always interesting to go in. And like I said, you can go into the candle glance and you're going to see right away which ones you might be interested in looking at. All right, so the other one I'm gonna look at, um, you know, we were noticing that small and mid caps were really diving. I thought I'd just take a quick peek at the mid caps and I'm gonna look at some of the ones that are uh, really causing some of the problems here. And I'm guessing because they do have these big scooter moves, uh, you know, that are changing. 
the direction. This one really is quite interesting as far as the top down. Flex Pharma, uh, you know, it took a big hit. It gapped way down. I suspect there was some sort of news going on here. Uh, but now we've got that giant gap. I honestly might consider looking at this one, you know, later, maybe putting it in a watch list just because, you know, gaps generally close. And so I'd probably want to be watching it just to see if we can get uh, some more interesting, you know, action, uh, see if it can get start making its way up to close that gap. Of course, with that PMO cell signal, and, and of course, the scooter now taking a giant dive today with that big gap down a 68% drop right now on Flex Pharma. So interesting to see FLKS. Uh, let's look at the, the top side movers for the large caps real quick. And the big movers right here, I'm gonna go ahead and move it right into the candle glance. There you go. We can see these are these are two day charts or I'm sorry, these yes, these are the two day 10 minute bar charts. Uh, I think I'm going to go over to my actual account and I'm going to look at the large caps and use my candle glance style. And again, you can change your candle glance style to be whatever you want it to be. Uh, just save that chart style as candle glance and that will set it up every time you're going to see it this particular way or whichever way it is you would like to see it. So I wanted to take a look in my candle glance style, mainly because I have the PMO on it. So I was going to see if we had anything that looked interesting right now, as we were talking about with like a new PMO move or a nice uh, breakout or that sort of thing. Uh, so when I, I'm taking the quick peek here, um, that's pretty volatile with Disney, but I, we know what's going on with that. Um, but I think that one might be an interesting one to uh, consider. You know, I did get that buy signal that came in. It actually came in long before uh, this whole, um, you know, acquisition talks started going. And we've got the 20, 50 day EMA positive crossover. That 50 looks like it's going to cross that 200 and we can get into a long term uh, trend model buy signal and put Disney in a bull market configuration. But with a nice breakout, uh, even though it's it's really on you know the news uh, more than the uh, internal strength of the stock, I do think there is some internal strength here. You can see that improvement in the scooter. And like I said, new PMO buy signal, uh, nice breakout as well uh, above that 106 level. So might be one to watch. Uh, look for that pullback maybe back toward 102. 5106. Those were the ones that I had to look at uh, for the scooter. Uh, what what did you have on? Okay, well, let's pull up first. Um, I have a chart on the truckers because trucking transportation stocks I mentioned earlier really have caught fire and the truckers and the railroads have been the best area within this space. And uh, most of the railroads are large companies and the truckers, you can get some smaller companies and many of the small caps are doing well. So I decided I'd focus uh, looking at scooters on the truckers, but I wanted to first just go over the trucking index and take a look. This is a fairly significant breakout. When you look back, we had been consolidating off that January high, actually had what I consider, you know, maybe we could get uh, Bruce Fraser to comment on this sometime, but it looks to me like a spring where uh, under Wyckoff, when you consolidate, you go through that reaccumulation phase you break down temporarily or what looks like a breakdown and then you spring off of it. That's exactly what this looks like to me after what looked like a pretty significant breakdown on the chart. We have just come roaring back where we've gone from almost 750 to the downside up to what eight, almost 880 now to the upside. We're not too far away from having about a 20% move and it's only been about five or six weeks since that bottom. So truckers really performing well. I showed earlier how the transports are wildly outperforming the utilities. And this was a key area of resistance during the consolidation period where we were trying to get the transports back through 10,800. We did that, we made the breakout. And when you look at the transports relative to the S&P 500, they've definitely got an upsloping um, bias to them over the past few months as we've been consolidating. So it looks to me like money is rotating towards the transports. And then when you look within the transports over these last six weeks, there's no doubt the truckers are getting a lot of this money 
to uh, move to the upside. So I, I just really like the way the truckers are performing relative to that benchmark and relative to their peers. So that's where I kind of started this scooter analysis is I wanted to take a look at the truckers. So if you go into the scooters, and actually that those are the results. Let me show you how you get to the results. So if you go into the uh, member dashboard and you go down to the scooter reports in the control center and you click on scooter reports, the default is to look at large cap stocks, but I want to look at the small caps. And I've spoken at length on the show and in my blog about why I like the small caps and why I think the dollar's going higher and so forth. So I won't spend any more time on that. But if I click on the small caps, then you can use this search table. And this is really cool because I can begin to look for some, you know, an industry group, a sector, maybe a name with a certain, um, you know, just a, a certain name within the name. For instance, if for some reason I wanted to, you know, look at global, uh, if I typed in global, you know, Intel Sat Global would come up here. Anything with the word global would come up. Um, but in this case, I want to look at trucking. So I'm going to type in truck. And you can see the trucking. These are all stocks coming out of the trucking group. And I wanted to just pull up a few of these. Now you've got them in scooter order. So you can see which ones look best. Um, I thought ARCB, it's in a uh, nice bull flag consolidation after a move to the upside. So I thought I'd pull this one up and show you. Here's a huge move. Stock went from $37 to $47 in one day. I believe that was earnings related. Since then, it is simply consolidating those gains. It's had great support down here around this 46 level. And you can see the rising 20-day moving average at about 46, uh, it's at 46.76. So I think 46.47 on a pullback would be interesting. And we did have a possible reversing candle go in yesterday. We kept uh, moving higher with these hollow candles. And then yesterday we had a filled candle after we made a breakout intraday. So that kind of warned me that we could be in for a little bit of short-term weakness. If that were to pull back to 46.47, I think you could keep a fairly tight stop on ARCB and perhaps benefit from small cap stocks, assuming they continue to outperform with what I think will eventually be a uh, continuing rising dollar. Uh, so that was one that I had, but we could go in and take a look at the, some others. Um, SAIA, and I'll just go down the list for maybe these first four or five stocks. SAIA is breaking out. My only problem here is that the volume... Like, for instance, today, it's only 90,000 shares. We're well past the halfway point of the day now. I like to get at least an average of 200,000. This is borderline. But what's not borderline is the technical merits of the stock. This looks very bullish to me. I love the fact that we broke out above this uh, key area of resistance. Uh, we did so on increasing volume at the end of May. Pulled back, nice little hammer right on support and the rising 20-day. And then we go up and we break out to new highs. I think a pullback back down close to $84 would be the first key area of support. And then the rising 20-day would be your next. So I think SAIA looks rather interesting at this point. Uh, we can go back over to the list. And CVTI, next up. Um, another really nice looking chart. Don't like today's candle much, but that could present an opportunity. If it finishes like this, it might just simply be setting up a pullback to test the breakout area around 3250. We got up as high as 3519 earlier today. Pullback to 3250 would be a nice little pullback, hitting price support and likely getting very close to that rapidly, uh, excuse me, rapidly increasing uh, 20 day moving average. So CVTI is certainly one to keep an eye on. Now, when I look at this, the next one to pull up would be FRPH. I look over here and I see today's volume, 9,000 shares. I don't. I just skip it. I'm not interested in the stock that's trading 9,000 shares on the day. I don't want to be the one uh, that moves the market with my order. So uh, not, not really interested in that. Uh, but we can keep going. Let's take a look at Martin Transport, MRTN. This one's getting very close to some overhead resistance. Really nice uptrend in play. It went through gap resistance. Uh, volume has been pretty good off of the bottom. You can see as we've been moving up, volume has been pretty solid. But we do have some overhead resistance to try and negotiate. If we could get through about 2475, I think we'd have a really good chance to go back up to the top of that black candle at 2850. So there are some opportunities, I think, with MRTN as we move forward. Uh, the next one, ULH, again, only 44,000 shares. I'm going to skip it. And then maybe take a look at these next two. Werner's got an, a scooter rank of 56. 
And then KNX is only at 39, but it is up 12 today. So it could be doing something. You can see the volume on both of these pretty good. So let's take a look at these last two real quick. Werner Enterprises, W-E-R-N. I don't like today's candle. We're at a major area of price resistance. But if we could finish strong today, get some volume coming in this afternoon, that would be awesome. But failure to do so, I think we'd probably be looking for $37 to $38 as a support level in the near term. And the last one, KNX, Night Swift Transportation. It's gaining 12 points because it's making a fairly significant breakout above 42. We do still have overhead resistance, though, at about 42 and a half. So this is going to be a key area just as the PPO hits uh, the center line resistance overhead. So those are the stocks that I looked at uh, from a scooter report standpoint. You can get see the summary slide here, how Aaron uh, filtered hers down. And then for me, I just literally took a group and then I showed you from the uh, members dashboard how you could go into a certain area, large cap, mid cap, small cap, type in in that search box what you're looking for, and it actually brings those stocks up for you, which is a great, great uh, uh, piece of service at Stock Charts. So, okay, well, we've got uh, roughly a minute or two left um, in the show. I know we were talking about, uh, you know, some big reversals in the market, but I do want to keep it in context. The uh, S&P 400 mid cap index, we were hitting the January high up around 2000. Um, the last couple of days, we went above it, couldn't really negotiate, get through it on at least nothing meaningful. And we're backing back off of it. But the longer term chart, I think, still looks good. But we we have made a big move. So I think there is some potential downside, Aaron, as we mm -hmm. uh, go into the Fed meeting and the announcement this afternoon. Yeah, I just thought that was interesting when we did that market update to see <clears throat> excuse me, that, you know, the small caps, especially the mid caps, are really taking a dive. Yeah, on the intraday chart, it looks worse, I think, than if you pull up the daily chart. But oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely we were making a move to the downside, no doubt about it. But there is room to the downside. I just didn't want to be too alarming uh, because we are in a nice uptrend. But short term, we're definitely uh, vulnerable to some downside action as the Fed gets set to uh, tell us what we can look forward to as we go forward. Mm hmm. Uh, here's our weekly schedule. Uh, Bill Shelby will, will be in tomorrow. Uh, I just wanted to make sure we had that. We didn't have a, the date quite right. So Arthur Hill will also be co-hosting for me while you're gone. So that'll yeah. be great. Yeah. And Arthur, if uh, you're not familiar with Arthur, he's been uh, doing his own thing on stock charts and also writes on the Don't Ignore This Chart blog, follows momentum, uh, has a unique way of looking at the market. I'm sure you're going to get a lot out of uh, having Arthur on to join Aaron on Friday. So uh, everyone should be looking forward to that for sure. I certainly am. Yeah, and you should be. I mean, it's always <laughs> fun to have Arthur on the show. I'll and, miss you, though. Well, I'll miss you as well. But I am going to be uh, out playing some golf this weekend for Father's Day weekend, heading out of town on Friday morning. So, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll definitely touch base when I get back on Monday, though, for sure. Mm -hmm. All right. I do want to thank everybody for uh, being with us today. Uh, special shout out to uh, Rick for uh, joining us earlier in the program. He had a great presentation. I hope you all enjoyed that. Uh, please remember to complete the survey as you exit. We do love to get your feedback, hear what you think of Market Watchers Live. As a quick reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great afternoon, everybody. We'll see you back here tomorrow and watch out for the Fed at 2 p.m. Happy mm -hmm. trading. Thank you.